herself. All right. Thank you so much, Becky. Welcome, everybody. As Becky mentioned, my name is Cassidy Hall, and I am a family and consumer sciences agent with North Carolina Cooperative Extension. That sounds very long and super fancy, but that is really just a fancy term for a nutrition and food safety educator. Um, so that's really what I specialize in. Um, and we, as North Carolina Cooperative Extension, we are an extension of NC State University and NC a &T University. And we are in every county in North Carolina. Um, so if you're joining from somewhere other than Johnston County, be sure to reach out to an extension office near you. Um, we have tons of resources, but like I said, my position focuses mostly on nutrition and food safety. Today, I wanted to kind of talk about meal planning. Now, meal planning can sometimes be, you may picture this as a very daunting or overwhelming subject, or maybe this really excites you. My grandparents, they heard that I, I actually plan out my grocery list every single week. And they were like, what? Why do you do that? Why do you have to know what you're going to cook each night? Well, really, what they don't know is that the reason I do this is less to know about what to cook, and it's more about saving money. Um, yes, I want to eat as many good-for-me foods as I can. I, I work those into my meal plan every single week or my menu, but really, this is about maximizing your food dollars because especially right now, times can be tough, and we want to be sure that we stretch our dollar the most, and planning your meals out ahead of time really Really helps you to do that. It helps you to not only kind of have an idea of what you're going to be having for dinner or whatever meal that it is, but it also helps you to know what you need to buy at the grocery store or what you need to be on the lookout for. And sometimes this can also help to make sure that you don't have food that is wasted because food wasted is money wasted and that neither of those is good uh, in my opinion. So maybe a, a good starting point is let's kind of think about how much money we should or maybe should limit ourselves to when it comes to our food budget. Now this is a seven day week, a weekly at home kind of plan. Um, and there's a thrifty plan, which is like super frugal and money saving. And then there's a low cost plan. And this is what it is, is estimated to cost to eat a, a nutritious diet to give you the energy needs that your body needs um, for one week based on each person in your household. So if you have two people in your house, you would identify what if they are male or female or a child, um, figure that out first and then look at their age group and then you just kind of slide over to the right and that tells you what that person costs to feed for one week. So I'll give you a little bit of an example. This is for just my husband and myself and this does not, I should also say, this does not include fast food, this does not include restaurant food, this does not include paper products like toilet paper, paper towels, paper plates. It also does not include things like hygiene items. So your deodorant, your soap, toothpaste. This is just food, food for recipes that you prepare at home. And we know this is a good practice to get into because it costs so much less per serving to make a meal at home compared to going somewhere and paying someone else for that convenient convenience for them to make that food. So we want to cook as much at home as we can to save money. So as I mentioned, right now, just my husband and I in our house, we fall into this category of 19 to 50 years old. Um, I have a husband, so he is male, 19 to 50 years old. He cost $43 per week on the thrifty, most money smart plan. I am female, 19 to 50 years old. It costs about $38 to feed me for one week. So you add that up and that's $81 per week. Um, and that may sound like a lot, or you may, be, you may be thinking that doesn't sound like enough. And we'll talk about ways to kind of work on that in the next few slides. But suppose the average month has four weeks. So $81 per week and there's four weeks, so you multiply 81 times four, and this $324 is what it would cost to feed my husband and I for a month eating at home. Now, again, if you are eating fast food or restaurant food, your costs for food are gonna be far higher because the cost per serving 
to eat at home is much cheaper. And also think about what you put into your body, you get one body. You don't get to swap it out for a new one uh, while you're here. And so thinking about that, you want to consider what you eat to be an investment in yourself. Because if you take good care of yourself now, then that's going to be less money that you have to spend later down the road on things like hospital bills, medications, all that stuff. And two, think about the, the type of life that you get to live. Um, so you want to consider that as well. All right, so we kind of have an idea of what it maybe should cost to feed a person, at least in my case, a two-person family. Um, but I sent Becky this these slides so you can get a copy of that information from her and kind of take a little bit longer to figure out what it would cost your family. Next step, you want to identify your food resources. So this may include places like food pantries in your area. Um, if you are SNAP eligible and you receive that food assistance, you want to think about that as well. You also want to be on the lookout for any store flyers, circulars, or even the store app if you have the app on your phone. Um, that is a great place for coupons to know what's on sale and then plan your menus around what you already have access to. And again, cook at home. The more that you cook at home, Yes, there's a little bit of work that goes into it, but there are tons of recipes that require very, very small amounts of ingredients and equipment, as well as, you know, you don't have to be a pro chef to cook meals at home. There are simple, easy peasy recipes. And if you have kids, then this is a really great opportunity to get them involved as well in helping to prepare these meals. So think about what can you what can you collect? What food resources can you get from places like your food pantries? What kind of SNAP funds do you have access to? Check those coupons. What coupons do you have and cook at home? All right, so let's say that you've already kind of taken inventory. You've already looked at all those things. What's next? Next is your menu. You want to identify or plan out your menu. Um, and this, this is totally up to you how many days at a time that you do this, but it could be something as simple as three days at a time. Maybe you have a crazy schedule and you can't think beyond three days. This week, my life is like that. And so three days at a time is kind of what I'm thinking about or you could go for a full seven. And if you're really into the menus and you're, you've gotten a lot of practice up under your belt, because again, pro practice makes progress, then maybe you could plan for even longer. But I'll, I like to recommend about three days to a week, um, at least for myself. But you wanna see what ingredients you already have. If you already have these ingredients, then those are things that you don't have to buy. And that money you save can go towards things like if your kids need school supplies, or say you have a doctor bill that needs to be paid, or maybe your car's broken down. You now have this extra money to be able to put towards that when you shop your fridge, your freezer, and your pantry. This is also a really great place to start by checking those expiration dates. Any food that is about to expire, or if you've got some things in your fridge that need to be used up before they go bad, Go ahead and put that at the beginning of the week. Put that as the first couple things on your menu. Next, think about what is on sale. Now, typically, um, foods that are in season, and here in North Carolina, we grow lots of fruits, vegetables, all kinds of foods. Um, so think about what is in season. Sure, when you're at the grocery store, you can buy whatever you want. It, it can be shipped from wherever. But when it's in season, it not only tastes better, but it's also cheaper. Um, it's cheaper because there's a lot less cost that goes into getting it to that grocery store. So think of that as well. You know, we're about to jump into strawberry season. So maybe over the next month or so, strawberries are going to cost a whole lot less than maybe they do right now. So think seasonally. Next, check your store circular or the store app. I kind of mentioned this a little bit before, um, but this is gonna tell you what's on sale so that you can plan ahead. Every time that I start my menu, I start out, I shop at Food Lion because that's what's near my house. I'll get on that store app and I'll look at what's on sale and I base my entire menu around these foods. 
Another thing that you want to do is be flexible. Um, this can save you money. Sure, it's great to have a plan. It's great to have a menu, but it's set, suppose you've got you know salad on the menu. This is just something easy. And maybe your favorite green to put in a salad is spinach, but you find that spring mix is actually on sale so you can sub that out. You can substitute that spring mix, buy that instead of the spinach because it's gonna be cheaper. And it still pretty much stays in line with your meal plan. Let's suppose that maybe you had tacos on your menu for one night and maybe you were gonna have ground beef or ground turkey. Well, suppose you get to the store and you see that chicken is on sale. There's a manager special going on. They need to get rid of it. Buy the chicken instead and have chicken tacos. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can be flexible while still maintaining and sticking to that menu that you've already planned out. Think about coupons. Um, I can't express this enough. Your coupons can be your best friend, but there are also some things that you need to be aware of. Coupons, a lot of times they will give you coupons at the store and it will a lot of times be for things that you never even thought about buying. If it's not something that you're going to eat that week that is going to be on your menu, it's really not of any use to you. Save that for another week, put it off until it expires, but keep up with your coupons so that they don't go bad. But remember, if you don't need to use it, if you weren't ever going to buy that item to begin with, don't buy it, don't use the coupon. It's costing you nothing to put it aside and not use it. It'll cost you more if you buy something just to use a coupon. Another thing is a lot of times these store coupons will be for the name brand items. So for example, um, and we all have our things where, you know, I, I may be somebody who has a certain brand of ranch dressing that I like, or I'm a, that may not matter to me. So this is kind of going to get into your personal choices as well. But suppose that there is the more expensive salad dressing on sale with a coupon, and maybe normally it's like $5 a bottle, which I would consider that to be very expensive. So this $5 bottle of dressing is now on sale for a whole dollar off. So now it costs $4. But does the store brand cost even less? Most of the time, it will cost even less than using the coupon. It'll cost less if you just pay full price for the store brand. So your coupon for this specialty dressing may be where you could buy it for $4 instead of five. But if you bought the store brand of this dressing, then maybe it's only gonna cost you $1.50. So think about that as well. So be on the lookout, beware of coupons. They can be your best friend, but they can also be something that encourages you to spend money that you really shouldn't. Another thing to keep in mind is to stretch your recipes. Stretch your recipes. It does not have to be stretching it with meat. Um, that's a lot, at least in my family, they love to just double the meat in recipes to stretch it, to make it last longer. That is very expensive. Now, if that works for you and that's what you enjoy, sure, stick to it. Hopefully you have a coupon, you find something on manager special. But in terms of something like tacos, you could substitute some of that meat with beans. Beans are very inexpensive. They're very good for you. That's going to stretch your recipe and cost a whole lot less. You could also stretch your recipes with vegetables. Now, people like to say healthy eating is really expensive. They say that's why they don't do it. But when you think of about it in the right way, it's really not expensive. Vegetables, when you buy, you know, whole carrots or whole zucchini or whole whatever fruit or vegetable, it's very inexpensive. Where it gets you is when you pay for that convenience and you buy something that's already cut up for you. So think about that as well. When it comes to things like ground turkey or ground beef, you can easily disguise mushrooms. And even people who come to my classes and they say, oh, I hate mushrooms, I could never eat this, they get tricked and they love it. And they say, I never knew that I could like mushrooms. But if you have a food processor, throw the mushrooms in there and then cook that alongside. If you have meat going into a recipe, cook it alongside that as well. And also think about serving vegetables that you can prepare once and then eat again later. I call these, or some people would say that's meal prepping. 
you can call it meal prepping or you could call it a pre-prepared ingredient. So something really inexpensive, bell peppers and onions. You can chop those up, put them on a sheet pan, stick them in the oven with a little bit of olive oil. You can roast those for 15, 20 minutes, pull them out, and now you've got something that's perfect for tacos, spaghetti, um, salads. You can really use peppers and onions for almost any recipe under the sun. So think about how you can use vegetables to stretch recipes and get the most bang for your buck. One more thing that I'll mention is serving vegetables um, as like your main entree instead of as a side. That'll really help people to eat more vegetables. If you take a look at the picture that I have in the top right, there's a pasta dish. There is very little pasta in that recipe and it is stretched with vegetables. So it increases how good for you that is. It adds flavor because we know that cooked vegetables add lots of flavor to foods and it's really inexpensive to do that. Now there are a couple of different methods that you could go about your meal planning or coming up with your menu. There are some people that prefer to just cook a whole batch of chicken and then use that chicken in different recipes. Totally fine. Um, I would consider this to be the, the method that has the least amount of effort with it, which is perfect for people who are really busy or just don't love to cook. On the other hand, we, you can get more variety and use up your coupons, assess what you can get at food pantries, use your SNAP benefits if you go the meal variety method. And this is absolutely gonna be based on what is available, what is on sale, what is in season. So this is, the, this is kind of what I'm gonna focus on for my next couple of slides. Um, and I'm gonna just kind of walk you through what it's like to meal plan or create a menu based on what you already have on hand. And maybe before we jump into this, uh, Becky, do we have any questions in the chat box? We'll take a break real quick. Not at the moment, but please feel free. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. If you do have questions or comments, feel free to, to throw them in the chat box. If you have access to the chat box, I am here manning it. Um, and the more engagement, the better I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, you guys feel free to put those questions in there. I'm happy to answer as best I can. All right, so this is my actual meal plan um, that I, when I created this presentation, I really used what I was eating that week. That is another question that people love to ask me. What do you eat? So you guys are gonna get a glimpse into that. Um, I do have over in, in the yellow, this is what I had on hand that week. So I cleaned out my freezer, I cleaned out my pantry and my fridge. That was my first step. I already had some lean ground turkey, I had pork chops. My husband likes to fish, so we had fish. Um, I had some cheese left over. I had some spinach, mushrooms, and cabbage that were all about to go bad. I had some sweet potatoes because you know those things last. And then in my freezer, I had frozen Brussels sprouts. I had a little bit of flatbread um, bread left over and a little bit of pasta sauce. So. The first thing that I wanted to use up was that ground turkey because it had already been thawed for a little while and I knew I needed to use that first. So I can add whatever kind of spices to that ground turkey. And I also knew that I needed to use up cabbage. Now, some people, you could use cabbage in the place of lettuce and put it on top of a taco, or we really like to roast steaks of cabbage. You just cut it into like large chunks throw it in the oven with some olive oil and spices, and it's really, really good. Well, I could put some similar spices as I use on the ground turkey on the cabbage. And so now the only thing I really need to buy is I like to add things like bell peppers and uh, black beans and corn into my tacos. So I just need to buy those things. So I first list everything I have, or at least make a mental note of what I have. Okay. And then I begin making my list based on my menu. So as I move through each day of the week, you'll see in the blue, these are the items that I know I need to buy. So Monday, I'm having tacos, refried beans, and cabbage steaks. And also in the yellow, I'm bolding what I'm using up. On Tuesday, 
I'm now going to use up those pork chops that I had. I've got those sweet potatoes and I have frozen Brussels sprouts in my freezer. Um, so that's an entire meal right there and I don't have to buy a thing. So I don't have to buy anything for my Tuesday meal. On Wednesday, I'm gonna use up that cheese, that spinach, those mushrooms. And then I also have the flatbreads as well as pasta sauce so I can make pizza. And I'm a person who loves pizza. So this is normally um, some things that I would call staple items that I always have in my fridge. But, you know, my husband, he wants to make sure that there's a little bit of meat on his pizza. So we're going to buy some diced ham and you'll see later that I can use that same ham all over again. On Thursday, we are going to have fish. Um, it's really good for your heart if you can start incorporating more fish into your diet. But we have fish. Potatoes are pretty cheap. It's a good source of, you know, energy to keep me moving. And green beans, I personally love, and they're very inexpensive. So now I just have to buy two things for my Thursday menu. All I have to buy is potatoes and green beans. And that's really, really inexpensive. Friday, I'm going to use up what little bit of spinach I have left, and I'm also going to throw in some of that diced ham that we're going to have on our pizzas earlier in the week. So now, all I have to buy for this recipe is eggs. So just to kind of refresh and examine my list, you can see still in blue, I have the items that I need to purchase. Um, and I, if you're buying multiples of something, put that in your buy section as well. So you see that for the bell peppers, I need two of those. And when I get to the store, I may not remember that I need two. And so it's good to just kind of put into practice writing down how many of something that you need. Because how many times have you thought that you had something and you get ready to make that recipe and you're like, oh no, I don't have this. Well, I guess it's time to go get some fast food or you end up eating a bowl of cereal for dinner, which is fine, but it's a little disappointing, at least to me, whenever I don't have all the ingredients that I need. So planning this out ahead of time not only helps to make sure you have ingredients so that you can actually go through with your plans, but it also helps you save money so you don't overbuy. After you've gotten your list of things to buy, you then want to add your staple items. So milk and bread are staples at my house. Um, and you may have things like apples or bananas or things that you just kind of eat regularly. Make sure that those are on your list as well. And you see that highlighted in yellow. This is probably my favorite part of the list um, or organizing because I'm a person who really likes to organize. This is helpful because it helps you not have to go down all different aisles of the store. It helps you not spend extra time in the store um, just chasing after things. And you're like, oh shoot, well, I was already on this side of the store. Now it's time to go back. This takes care of all of that. So I look at my list and I organize it based on where it is in the store. So I know for the produce section, I'm looking for two bell peppers and potatoes. I then move right along to the canned items and my refried beans are there, the black beans are there, corn and green beans are there as well. For the grains, breads and tortillas are typically together. I can grab that all in one stop. I really, for this week, didn't need very many meats, um, but the diced ham, I can grab that as I'm making my way to the dairy and egg section to pick up my milk, eggs, and sour cream for my tacos. So again, this is really going to help you to save time and save money because you're not chasing all over the store with, you know, the stores, they market and try to advertise these different items like Little Debbie's and soft drinks and all kinds of things that you really don't need and that's going to up your grocery bill. So keep that in mind. So now you're ready to shop. You have your list organized, um, but this could also be an opportunity for you to find your more expensive items um, if you're able to go to the food pantries um, or use some of your SNAP benefits. So most of the time, 
food pantries will have a lot of canned items. They tend to get lots and lots of beans. Um, and so I know that I can get those at a food pantry. I could also get my tortillas at, and you may be even be able to get bread, but you may have to be a little bit more flexible about the kind of bread. So again, remain flexible, but think through, okay, what does the food pantry typically have? What can I get there that I don't have to spend my money on or my SNAP benefits on? So keep that in mind as you're kind of thinking through your menus. Now, while you're at the store, I've kind of tapped into this just a little bit. You do want to be sure that you stick to your grocery list. Um, sticking to your list helps you not buy junk food and it helps you not buy items that you didn't need um, because you should really, at, while you're at home and taking inventory of everything you have, this is how you know if you need to or if you don't need to purchase something. Um, so as you're planning your menu, think of everything that you're going to need and stick to your grocery list. I would also say don't grocery shop while you're hungry um, because you'll be a lot more tempted to put things into your cart that you really don't need. Avoid those aisles that don't contain things on your list. So my mom, I can remember as I was growing up, she would always you know, say, well, I'm going to walk down this aisle just to see if there's anything I think I need. Well, you should already know what you need based on your grocery list. And if you walk down those aisles, you're most likely going to find something that you really don't need that's going to increase your grocery bill um, and you're just going to throw it in the cart. So avoid those aisles that don't contain items that you actually have on your grocery list. Always well, I say always, I would say maybe 95% of the time, select the store brand. Um, most of the time, these foods, no matter if it's frozen vegetables, canned foods, cereals, does not matter what it is. Most of the time, it is going to be made and packaged in the exact same facility as the main brand, and they just put a different label on it. So always, always, always select the store brand unless it's just something where you notice a, a major difference in taste. Um, but be aware of product placement. A lot of times your most expensive items will be at eye level. So I always, you know, once I think I found what I'm looking for, I then look up and I really look towards the floor because that's going to be where your least expensive items are. Um, so keep that in mind. Always, always, always look up and look down because the most expensive items are going to be at your eye level. It's part of that product placement and marketing. The next thing that you want to do is to think about the unit price. Now, most of the time when we go to the grocery store, we see this big sticker price. You see here in this picture, $3.49, $3.49 for whatever this is. This is the price for that entire package of food. But if you were to divide it up by servings based on how many ounces or pounds, whatever it is that you're buying, there's gonna be a price per unit. And in this case, whatever this ham, I see now nine ounces of ham, it costs 38 cents per ounce. And that is how they get this big sticker price. This is really important when you're thinking about if you should buy in bulk or you're trying to decide between two different items that are very similar. Here's an example. Um, I've always heard buy it in bulk because that's the best deal. I'll be honest with you, it's not always the best deal. Um, I have gone to the store several times and I have noticed that one gallon of milk will be a dollar more than if I bought two half gallons. So I'm still getting the same amount of milk, but if I buy the big, the gallon container, I'm actually paying a dollar more. Um, not all the time. And this is the same with cosmetics and you know hygiene items, but you always wanna check that unit price. In this case, we can get 25 ounces of applesauce for a dollar and 25 cents, which breaks down into five cents per ounce or you could pay $2.19 for a 50 ounce jar. And you do come out in this case, a penny cheaper per ounce um, buying in bulk. But you always wanna check that unit price to know what is gonna be the best bang for your buck. You also wanna make fruits and vegetables cost effective. We know that the more fruits and vegetables that we can eat, we can lower our risk of getting things like type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, 
heart disease, high blood pressure. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Fruits and vegetables are one of the most underrated foods that we don't eat enough of. And it's because people think that they're just too expensive, but there are actually very, very economic money savvy ways to purchase fruits and vegetables. Like I mentioned earlier, you wanna think about what's in season. When it's in season, it's gonna cost you less. Consider frozen. You can buy frozen fruits and vegetables that are just as good for you as compared to the fresh. You can also buy canned fruits and vegetables that are still very, very healthy options. Uh, we live in a time where you can buy low sodium or no salt added vegetables and beans. And this is really gonna be helpful if you or somebody in your house deals with high blood pressure. If no salt added cans are not available, then you can dump it into a colander or a strainer, run it under some running cold water, and I like to say until you don't see any more of the bubbles, and this will actually lower the amount of sodium by about 30 to 40%. So keep that in mind with your canned vegetables and beans. And finally, with fruits, you want to look for 100% juice. And I can promise you there is going to be no cost difference to purchase it this way. And you might say, no salt added. Is it going to taste good? Yes, because you can add salt to it. It does not defeat the purpose because you will be adding less salt than if it was already in there for you. So keep that in mind as you're making these decisions. I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but you definitely can buy pre-bagged, pre-cut up fruits and vegetables. And if that works in your food budget, if it makes your life easier and it makes you more likely to eat fruits and vegetables, go for it. But if you're like me, I am a proud penny pincher. And so I buy them whole and then cut it up and put them in bags myself. And this is going to save you money. Another thing that people have told me from time to time is that they just don't eat fruits and vegetables because they can't afford to buy organic. Please, 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 please do not let that stop you. You do not have to eat organic fruits and vegetables to be eating healthy fruits and vegetables. In fact, um, nutritionally, they are exactly the same. Um, so you can get a lot more bang for your buck, but this is absolutely a personal choice. So you make the decision that's right for you, but never feel bad if you can't afford to buy organic because you're still eating fruits and vegetables and it is far healthier to eat fruits and vegetables than none at all because of the price. Um, so keep that in mind as you're making those decisions as well. And we're almost done. We're almost wrapping up here. But with all of this food and menus, you have to make time to schedule your prep. Um, and this could be as little preparation or as much preparation as you want. Like I mentioned earlier, you may be a person who says, I'm just going to cook a whole large batch of chicken and then I'll reuse it in different dishes throughout the week. Totally fine. Or you may be a person who after you get home from work, you're really tired, you just want to get on the, a meal on the table as fast as possible. So maybe on one of your days off or in some of your free time, go ahead, wash and cut up those fruits and vegetables and do what you can ahead of time to save you time after work later in the week. And you may be questioning, well, how long are these foods going to keep? And it really depends on the, the temperature of your refrigerator. So most of our newer refrigerators, they are typically below 41 degrees. And you can buy a fridge thermometer to know for sure. Uh, but if your refrigerator is at 41 degrees or lower, you're actually getting a full seven days. Um, but if your refrigerator is a little bit warmer, still cold, but it's a little warmer at 45 degrees, then you only get three days max. Um, so you want to consider that in how long these foods are going to keep. But remember, your fresh foods, your fresh fruits and vegetables and fresh meats, put those at the beginning of your menu plan so that you can use those up first. And finally, these are just some different recipe resources. Um, I love these websites. Eating Well and Skinny Taste have just all kinds of recipes under the sun. Budget Bites, though, it's really a wonderful balance between super uh, 
mindful of cost and cost savings and also good for you. Um, so Budget Bites is probably my favorite website as well as chopchopfamily.org. And then through North Carolina Cooperative Extension, we have a website where you can also find low cost recipes that are minimal effort and very good for you as well. All right, Becky, that's all that I have for today. So I guess now would be a great time to take some questions. Absolutely. So if there are any questions out there in of the virtual world, you can either feel free to pop those in the chat box or even unmute yourself at this point um, and ask Cassidy directly. Um, I know one that uh, maybe popped up for me. First of all, this information was, it was a wealth of information and extremely helpful and useful. And I love the chart of being able to take, I'm a family of five, so I have three little kids, husband, wife, and you know, being able to take that chart and really look at, okay, is what I'm spending on a weekly basis really kind of fitting into you know, the scheme of things? Where can I pare back? Where can I adjust things? So that was really helpful, I thought. Um, but could you describe to the audience the difference between, you mentioned organic, and why buy organic or not buy organic? Maybe our viewers out there, well, what's the difference? Yeah, that is a really great question and definitely something that is going to be personal to each person's family. So a lot of times people may think that organic means that there's no chemicals, no pesticides, none of that stuff on there. That's actually not true. Um, as part of the growing practice, there is a list of chemicals, if you will, um, that are derived from natural substances. Um, I'll give you an example. So Brown rice actually contains arsenic, but there's not enough of it by us eating brown rice or any rice that we are going to see any negative effects. But what they can do is concentrate that and use that to control weeds or, you know, bugs destroying the produce, whatever it may be. Um, so that that's really the difference. One is naturally derived and one is synthetic. But keep in mind that farmers do not ever want to spray things, whether it's organic or not. They never want to spray if they don't have to, because that stuff is very, very expensive, is very time consuming. Um, but as far as nutritional value, they're exactly the same, which is why I always tell people if you if maybe those things aren't important to you or if it doesn't fit into your food budget, you should never feel bad if you can't purchase something that is organic um, because it's going to be nutritionally, it's going to provide you the same vitamins, it's going to provide you the same fiber, the same benefits, and we should never feel bad. We want to eat fruits and vegetables, no matter if they're fresh, frozen, canned, doesn't matter, eat fruits and vegetables. I, and I love that. And I think oftentimes, you know, we're, we're often guilted or, or feel bad that you know, either we can't afford it or it's not available. Oftentimes, you know, we've got food deserts out there where, you know, some of this stuff just isn't available to individuals in our community members. And so thank you for sharing that information. What about um, Cassidy? You know, I have three little ones. What about our picky eaters? You know, what are some suggestions to get those picky eaters to eat the things that we want them to eat? That is another really good question. Now, I'll be honest with you. I do not have children of my own. However, I do work with children. I have younger cousins. You know, I do have little kids in my life, but they don't live with me. <laughs> but we know based on tons of studies that people have done based on behavior that if you can get your kids or grandkids, nieces, nephews, whoever, if you can get kids to help participate in cooking, they are going to be much more likely to try it. So, and you want to think about things that are, are within their skill set based on their age. So suppose you have a three-year-old. Well, a three-year-old can absolutely help you rinse off your fruits and vegetables. If you have an older child, maybe I would say six, there are children's knives that you could buy or you could teach them very, very carefully with soft foods like bananas or zucchini um, to kind of help, help them get involved in this process. Another recommendation is as you're planning out your menu, talk to them, ask them, is there anything that you would like to try this week? Are there any snacks that you would like to try? And when they get to help pick out those things, they have a little bit of control. And so they're a lot more likely to, to actually try to eat those foods. And of course, 
the younger you start kids introducing new foods to them, the better off that they will be, the more likely they will be to try new foods. And just because they don't like it one time doesn't mean that they may not like it again later. So keep reintroducing these things into their, into their life and let them choose and they'll be more likely to try it and to eat it. Great, great advice. Um, well, I just, again, uh, I want to thank you for spending um, your morning with us. Um, I hope that you will come back and continue um, to do some presentations and provide information to the community. We are so thankful to have you join us this morning and thankful for the partnership between uh, NC Cooperative Extension and Alliance Health. And I really continue to look forward to our work together in the future. Thank you guys so much for having me. All right. Take care, all.